Yes. We're here. We are live. All right. Well, that's really loud. I'm really live. Uh, <laughs> that scared me. I don't scare easily. I wake my, I wake up in this space every day, so I don't scare easily. And I'm glad to see everybody out, uh, even in the midst of this cold temperature. It's great to see everybody, especially you, Lincoln. Uh, Today's message is lost sheep and ugly pets. And I know what you're going to say. What in the world do lost sheep and ugly pets have in common? And what does this have to do with the last day of the year? I'll tell you. Hold your horses. <laughs> but before we get into the message, would you, write, would you stand with me one more time for the reading of God's Word? Matthew chapter 18, starting at verse 10. It says, See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that their angels in heaven continually see the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. What do you think? If any man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go and search for the one that is straying? And if it turns out that he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it, more than over the ninety-nine which have not gone astray. So it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Do bow with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity, this honor and privilege to speak to your people, Lord. I pray that uh, the words that would come out of my mouth would be from you and not me. That you would be magnified and glorified. That you would expand the cross of Calvary. Let it be visible to all today. And if there are any here that don't know you as a personal Lord and Savior, I pray today would be the day that they would come to know you. That they would welcome in a new year, in a new family, with a new life in you. We ask all these things in Jesus' precious and beautiful name. Amen. You may be seated. How many of you have ever heard that passage in Matthew 18 before? Okay. All right, all right. How many of you the first time? It's okay, it's okay. Hey, you know what? We are all on a journey here, right? None of us were born with a full knowledge of Scripture, were we? I know I wasn't. I'm still not. We're all on a journey to get to know Jesus better. We do that through prayer, through uh, fellowshipping with believers, through studying God's Word, and we get familiar with it. So whether you're really familiar with it, or whether this is the first time you've ever heard it, we're going to spend a little time here in Matthew chapter 18. If you have your Bible, feel free to open them up. I, I don't, uh, wouldn't put anybody out on opening up their Bibles. I think that's a great tool, and uh, what a sword to have. And if you need to borrow a pen to underline a passage, and ask me, I've got one. Maybe there's a pen or pencil in your view, too. But we're going to spend a little time in Matthew chapter 18 talking about lost sheep. Now, I'm going to ask a, a question that not preachers don't normally ask, okay? Is that all right? Okay. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. I know that if I gave you five more minutes, you might be closing your eyes anyway. But I'm going to ask you to close your eyes now, and I want you to imagine a scene. Imagine a, a beautiful green rolling hillside, dotted with daisies and, and wildflowers, dandelions, blue sky, warm sun beating down, fluffy clouds in the sky, and the, the meadow there with a few small trees that dot the horizon. In the middle of that meadow, there are sheep. And they're grazing peacefully. And I want you to look at that one little lamb. You see that little lamb there in that meadow? The little lamb looks up. He's not content with the, the grass of that meadow, so he, he wanders off just a little bit, a little bit of ways. And he sees a butterfly. And the, the <laughs> The butterfly startles him when it takes the flight, but then he gives chase, and he goes over the hillside in search of greener pastures, in search of chasing after that butterfly. And the shepherd, who was sitting on the hillside, lazily basking in the sun, 
He sees the lamp just go over the rise. And he gets up, he stretches, and he yawns, and he casually strolls over the hillside, and he picks up the lamp, and he returns it back to the pastor. Okay, you can open your eyes. All right. You've opened your eyes, Richard? No. All right, just check. I'm going to make sure. I don't want to lose anybody in that little not nice scene. Wouldn't that be nice right now, just the beautiful spring weather and seeing the sheep? Well, I don't know. It, is that how you picture this passage of Scripture? Some cute, cutesy little lamb, maybe some, some music playing in the background. This cutesy little lamb is frolicking in the grass and hops away, and the shepherd just picks it up. It's okay. It's okay. Come on back. Well, if you've ever spent any time with sheep, you'll know something. Dumb. Sheep are dumb. Oh, sorry. No, that's that's exactly what I was going to say. That's in my notes. I was going to say sorry. sheep are dumb. Say it with me. Sheep are dumb. Okay. I heard one pastor tell it a give an illustration. He was at a, a sheep farmer's house, and the sheep were in this little corral. And one of them, while, they, while the pastor and this farmer were talking, one of them went over into the corner, and he got his head right in the corner. And he started bleating. Real frantic bleating. And the pastor says, Farmer, what is wrong with that sheep? And the farmer says, well, he's lost. And the pastor says, uh, the others, they're just right there. I mean, he's, he's not lost. And the farmer says, yeah, but he doesn't know that. He's turned around. So the farmer goes over to the corner and he picks up the sheep and he heaves it around and forces it to go back. And when it sees the other sheep, it, it joins the herd again and it's calm. But sheep are dumb. They are dumb. They're incredibly dumb creatures. And this picture of this parable is, is not what you'd think. When we think of a uh, lost sheep. So I'm not going to ask you to close your eyes. And you can if you want to. If you're still tracking with me, you can close your eyes. I, uh, I know we're five minutes into it though, so I don't want to lose anybody on the, on the eye shaft business. So picture this again. That same hillside, but instead of bright blue skies, dark thunderclouds roll on the horizon. Lightning flashes. The shepherd is calling for the sheep to come back to the barn land to protect them. And that little lamb, instead of chasing a butterfly, is scared and it runs in the opposite direction. And it goes over the rise, but on the other side of the rise is a very steep embankment. And as the storm clouds above let loose their, their storehouses of water, that little lamb slips down that embankment, falls into the creek, which is starting to swell with water, starting to flood the banks, and the, and the little lamb is bleeding frantically. And it's trying to swim, and, and it gets to the other side, and it's pulling itself up, and it's getting muddy and clay and all sorts of junk on it. And it gets up the other side of the embankment. But this time it's separated from the pasture. The other side of the creek has thistles and thorns and cockaburs in it. Sticks get stuck in the lamb's wool. Thorns cut at the lamb's nose. The lamb wanders in the darkness, in the rain, in the, the thunder, until it is frightened to the near death. And it bleeds, loud, blant, loud frantic bleeds. Tired bleeds until it's weak and bleeds. This terrified lamb is muddy, wet, bleeding, covered in thistles and cockaburs. But this is when the shepherd comes. Through the darkness, through the rain, down the steep embankment, across the flooded river, onto the other side, through the thistles, through the thorns, through the cockaburs, to get to his precious because the shepherd loves the lamb. And he
and he picks that dirty, nasty little beast up. And he, he grabs it by the front legs and the back legs and he hoists it over his shoulder. So now he's carrying the full weight of the lamb. Plus he's, he's gotten himself muddy. He, he's, he's gotten scratched from the cockaburs that are embedded into the wolf's lamb. And the lamb's wool. And I've talked this morning. And he carries that lamb back through the, the weeds, back through the, the, the brush, back across the river, up the embankment, back into the barn. And only there can he care for it, can he bathe it, groom it, pick those cockaburs out, tend to the wounds, and only then will it be that beautiful, spotless lamb that we first imagined in our, our little uh, thing. But only after he's invested time in it. Let's read again Matthew 18, verse 10. See that you do not despise one of the little ones. For I say to you that their angels in heaven continually see the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. What do you think? If any man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains to go and search for the one that is straying? If it turns out that he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than the ninety-nine which have not gone astray. So it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. But that's the real picture we see, or we should see, when we think about that lost sheep that Jesus talks about. Now, what does this have to do with ugly pets? Anybody been wondering that question yet? Okay. Well, I was going to be on my A game. I was going to be prompt, punctual, and I procrastinated. And I did not get the pictures to Ellen to get up on the screen. But I want to talk about ugly pets. And not like your pets at home. Maybe you have these ugly pets at home. We do. I have one here I brought with me. If you can't see it, feel free to come see me afterwards. I'll show it to you. But this is a turtle. And one eye is open and one eye is shut. He's got buck teeth and really big feet and small arms. And he's got a, a, a starfish stuck to his forehead. It's just a really ugly, ugly thing. I'll just put him right there. But they make these toys, not very big toys. They're called ugly pets. That's their names. And they are a satirization of the littlest pet shop. And the little pet, pet shop toys are really cutesy and everything else. Well, these, not so much. These are like the garbage pail kids of Cabbage Patch Kids, if you guys remember those back in the day, right? Cabbage Patch Kids were all cutesy, garbage pail kids were all gross. This guy is definitely gross. But my son has eight of these, and they're all different ones. He's got, he's got dogs and cats and obviously a turtle. I borrowed this one with the condition that if I lost it, I would buy him more. I don't know what I was thinking when I made that promise to him, but I do not let me lose it. I don't want any more of these things in my house. But he loves these. And despite their less than perfect features. He loves and cares for each of the eight ugly pets that he has at home. And he wants to take them with him everywhere he goes. He has a pocket in his backpack that he takes him to school with him. He takes him to church. Ask me if I'm lying. My wife will tell you. This is the truth. We've come to a point you can take him but you can only take three, only three. We're not, we're not gonna lose the whole batch, we're gonna, three. Okay, fine, you can take them all, but they stay in the car. Okay, okay, you can take them all, just please stop whining, okay, something here. Okay, come on, parents, you know. I'm not this, I'm not the only weak one here. You guys know what this is like. And he takes them and he loves them. Plays with them, he, you know, cares for them. 
But you know what? Sometimes when you're six years old, you don't keep track of stuff that well. Sometimes when you're six years old, you forget that your parents said, you need to, you need to remember where those are at. We're not going to go looking for them if you lose them. Sometimes when you're six years old, you don't even realize you've lost something until it's bedtime, and you need to make sure that all of your toys are safely tucked in bed with you. And then there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I know there was eight. Dad, have you seen number eight? Mom, Mom, have you seen, have you, Where's number eight? I can't go to sleep without number eight. He has names for him, but I don't, I don't know what his names are. They're, they're gross. Yeah, gross, ugly, future, disgusting. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, as a parent, you know what this battle is like to realize that your child is not going to go to sleep until each and every toy is accounted for. They care about these things. God knows why. They're, especially these things. I mean, you know, some of his toys are pretty cool, but uh, some of them are, are just are not. And I can't tell you how many times I have torn apart the house at 9 o'clock at night or 9.30 trying to find an inch and a half tall ugly thing that could hide almost anywhere in the house. It could hide in a vent, it could hide under a cushion, it could hide under a coffee table. That's where I found the remote control several times. I just hide them under the coffee tables. I don't know why. I'm looking all over the house for this thing. And I don't care about ugly pets. This thing, it's just... It's gross to look at. Have you seen this thing? Look at this. This is, this is not cute. I mean, there's nothing cute about this thing. And, and yet, he wants to find it. And it was one of those nights where I was thinking, you have seven more. Say, let it go. Just... Let it go. And I started singing a song that Claire Joe, because she loves Frozen, and I'm singing, let it go, Sam, because I don't care about the number eight. It's disgusting. And then I heard a voice in my head, in my heart, said, Mark, who would want to spend time with such a disgusting creature? Who would even give such a grotesque creature a second glance? Who would care about their well-being and their safety? Who would want to snatch them up in pity? Such an ugly animal. And then I thought of Matthew chapter 18, verse 10. See that you don't look down on one of these little ones. Hey, guess what? It's not these that are ugly. I guess it's me. That's what Jesus is talking about. See that you don't look down on one of these little ones. Because I tell you that, they're, that in heaven their angels continually see the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Hmm. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep or eight ugly pets, if one of them gets lost, doesn't he leave the rest to go and search for the one who is strayed? And if he finds it truly, I say to you, he rejoices over that sheep more than over the ninety-nine or the seven that didn't get lost. In the same way, it is not the will of your Father in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Now, I don't obviously have a starfish smack to my forehead. I think both eyes are relatively the same size today. And my feet aren't abnormally huge. 
But you know, if I was to compare myself to an ugly pet or to a lost sheep, I'd have to say I'm the lost sheep and the ugly pet both. Because when the master called, instead of going towards him, I ran away from him. <clears throat> thinking I could find my own safety, thinking I could find my own, my own place in the world. And instead of finding safety, I, I slid down that, that embankment of temptation. And I got caught in the river of sin. And as I tried to climb myself out, I found myself in just a worse situation with the consequences of my actions and getting caught with the thistles and the thorns and the cockaburs of, of sin and what comes along with it. And then in my cries, Jesus, Jesus, here comes the shepherd. And he doesn't take an attitude like I had towards my son's ugly pets. No. <laughs> he loves me. He loves you. He came and found me in the middle of the mess that I had made of myself, for myself, and within it, myself. He comes to heal me, to restore me, to redeem me, to rescue me. He comes to make me whole again, new again, pure. He comes to make me white as snow, though my sins be as scarlet. Because the shepherd doesn't see me as ugly. He sees worth in me. He sees worth in you. And you know what? None of us are part of the 99. I want, I want that to be abundantly clear, okay? None of us are part of the 99. Every single one of us can relate to this in Matthew 18. Romans 12, 3 says, For the, by the grace given to me, I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he should think. Instead, think sensibly, as God has distributed a measure of faith to each one. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to, Mark. So I guess next time I'm searching for these ugly pets, I'll say, Mark, Mark, Mark. <laughs> Isaiah 53, 6 says, All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all, the sin, the mud, the mess of everything, to fall on Him, on Jesus. Every single one of us is that lost sheep in need of saving, being saved by Jesus Christ. Remember what verse 11 said there in 18? For the Son of Man has come to save the lost. Every single one of us were or are matted and covered in the mud of sin. We have been cut by the thorns of sin in this world. Our coats have been tangled with the sins that easily beset us. We have been weakened by the struggle of doing things on our own. We are not pretty creatures to behold. In fact, we're pretty doggone ugly. And yet, Jesus longs to have a relationship with each and every one of us. He longs to restore and to reconcile us to himself so that we could be a part of his pasture. Matthew 9, 36 says, seeing the people, this is, this is what's going on in Jesus' head, seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. And when he finds it, he rejoices over finding it because there is joy in heaven <coughs> over a lost one coming to Jesus. Jesus longs to have a personal relationship with you. He is the shepherd searching to great lengths to find you. And the greatest length that he ever went to 
is right behind me on the wall, the symbol of it. He went all the way to Calvary to die for your sins, for my sins, to take our place, to take our shame, to take our guilt, to take our punishment, to take our penalty, to take our death, so that we could have eternal life with him. Look at that cross. That's a pretty one. All varnished and sanded and polished. Polyurethane. I'm sure that that one he hung on was ugly. Dried blood on it. Rough hewn. The Romans didn't care whether he got a splinter. They were nailing it to the thing. That's an awfully pretty representation of one of the ugliest moments in all of history. That the creator would kill the creator. But he did that for us. To seek and save that which was lost. If you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, don't put it off. Don't hesitate. Don't, don't wait until, uh, until a couple years down the road. Don't wait until tomorrow. Don't wait. Don't wait at all, friend. What an awesome way to end a new year. To say goodbye to that lost, ugly self of yours. To be cleansed by Jesus. To be made whole by Him. To be found by Him and enter 2018 as a new year, a new person. A found person in Jesus Christ. Wouldn't that be amazing? Wouldn't that be awesome? Would you bow with me? I want you to really take some time to think about this this morning. There's a lot going on in this world. And it's easy to get caught up in things or to think, I can do this my way. I can handle this. I don't need that Jesus guy you're talking about, brother. Leave me alone. Some of you think that you can do it better. You can't. I'm telling you that right now. Maybe you haven't found yourself on the other side of that embankment yet. Maybe you haven't found yourself in the thorns and the thistles that will eventually come as a result of doing things your own way because you and I have rebelled against a holy God. But trust me, it will happen. It will come. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you're going to wait. You're going to wait until you're a miserable mess. Wait no longer. You're there. <laughs> I'm there. Come and accept Jesus Christ. Invitation. Salvation. Uh, and, uh, and you don't have to. You don't have to go anywhere. You, you don't have to step out into the aisle. But I'll tell you this. In your bulletins today, I have, I have a special insert. If you want to read through that, if you have questions, you can call me. If you want to make a decision today, I, that'd be great. I'd love to rejoice with you. I'd be the first one to welcome you to the family of God. But I, I, I pray that you would not hesitate. And, uh, and if you already know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, praise the Lord, that's great. You have been found and rescued by the one who cares about you no matter how ugly you appear from sin. I, uh, I have a vision for Parkside. The we would be uh, not responsible, but we would be contributing to the angels and the Father <clears throat> rejoicing because we would be leading lost people to 
faith in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> because right here in South East Iowa, in Burlington, Iowa, I can guarantee there's about 25,000 people out there 